Thank you. So, and um, thank organizers for putting me to the very end of this schedule. So I hope everyone's still awake, and and I hope this is not the only presentation you remember after the conference. <laughs> um, so I know exactly what you want at this moment. So I'm going to keep my talk as concise as possible. So, um, so I'm going to talk about our effort at Schrodinger to develop lower methods to address challenging perturbations that are outside the domain of applicability of conventional methods. Um, so as we all know, um, the original theory of FEP has been there for more than half a century. And since the initial application of FEP to calculate protein plant infinity, people have been focusing on uh, very small R group modifications and single atom mutations. For example, back in 1985, the Jorgensen group first applied FEP to calculate the solution finish difference between acin and methanol. And the following year, the McCammon group first applied FEP to calculate relative binding finish between benzamidine and fluorine benzamidine. And then in 1987, the Coleman group first applied FEP to study the effect of nitrogen to oxygen mutation on their relative binding finish. And even now, a large portion of research is still focused on very modest R group modifications and single atom mutations. So I have these two examples here. So one from the Jorgensen group in 2014, the other from McCoro group in 2017. So both focusing on relatively small R group modifications and single atom mutations. And those are very important and common mutations we can encounter in drug recovery projects and we have to acknowledge that it is definitely not easy to get those correct reliably. And at short again, we spend a lot of effort, both on the small molecule force field side and on the sampling side. And in 2015, we published this paper demonstrating that we can accurately calculate the binding failure changes for those modifications. And I think this plot has been showing in several presentations. Um, so Woody just gave a comment about this plot. Is he still here? Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to make a few, a few additional comments to make it clear So what we want to present in this plot. So first of all, I agree, the R square value of all the points from all different targets is misleading because that depends on the experimental information. However, we only reported R squared and RMSE for each individual target, which are statistically meaningful. That's the first point. Second is, if we want to do the selectivity, all you want is the binding infinity on different targets, which is similar to what we plot here. I'm not saying it's the same, okay? Third point is about the no hypothesis. Um, I think Guang Lei gave a very good presentation yesterday about this topic. And if you want to discuss more about this topic, I think uh, there is a very good, um, paper here, you can read more to see why the gas zero hypothesis is not a valid model. But this is not a focus of my talk, okay? So after that, FE plus has been used prospectively in many projects, and a similar level of accuracy is also obtained in those prospective studies. I think this is a real testing about any method. And last year, we spent a lot of effort and collected the FE plus performance on, I think, about 100 projects we were able to collect data on. This involves more than 100 targets with more than 3,000 ligands. And the overall RMSE is about 1.1 kcap more. And the MUE for the vast majority of projects is less than one, so in perfect agreement with the accuracy we're saying in the retrospective validation. And accurate calculation of energy change for R group modification and for single atom mutation already allows a large number of molecules to be tested. And we saw a great value already applying those methods. However, the impact of FEP is going to be limited if you restrict yourself to those modest, small modifications. Because in drug discovery projects, the chemists always want to explore a broader chemical space with more challenging perturbations. For example, 
if the core of the molecule have certain admin toxicity issue, then they want to do a scan for the hopping, for example, to change the size of rain, to introduce additional rains in the core of the molecule. So how do you calculate binding finish for core hopping modifications? Another example. So for drug targets that do not have deep buried binding pocket, blocking the protein-protein interface proves to be a very useful strategy. And microcycles are very good candidates to block protein-protein interface. So how to calculate the energy to cyclize the needle molecule into a big microcycle? Another example. So well, a majority of small molecules bind the target through land bounded vandals or electrostatic interactions. There is another class of small molecules that form covalent bound with protein residues in the binding pocket. <coughs> so how to score covalent inhibitors? And lastly, so sometimes to improve the solubility or binding potency or to balance other enemy toxicity issues, the chemists would like to consider perturbations that may change the light charge of molecule. So how to deal with charge perturbations? So over the past few years, we have been working on low methods to address <coughs> those challenges. And the talk is going to be focused on the methods to deal with those very challenging perturbations. So first about core hopping. So I mentioned earlier, sometimes the chemists would like to consider perturbations that change the size of the rain or introduce additional rains, the so-called scanford hopping or core hopping multiplication. And for, so for our group modifications, sometimes you can easily rewrite the synthetic route to make them without too much trouble. However, for core hopping modifications, because the topology of the pharmacophore is modified. So it really takes a long time to synthesize the molecule with a new core. And so because of the pharmacophore is changed, the majority of core hopping attempts fail to deliver any valuable matter to the project because most often it's not potent enough. But even that, core hopping is often attempted in discovery projects because very often, it is the only viable strategy to address a particular enemy toxicity issue. And also the lower IP generated by core hopping makes it even more attractive. So therefore, if we can do accurate French calculations for core hopping modifications, then we can enable the chemist to pursue core hopping attempts with confidence that the resulting molecule will be potent for the project going forward. OK, a little bit theoretical consideration. So compared to conventional R-group modification FEP, well, you can see the bounded stretch interaction between the leftover dummy atom and the physical atom won't affect the ensemble of configurations for the physical molecules. In core hopping FEP, this is different. So for example, showing here is a mutation to cyclize linear molecule into a field ring. If you retain all the bounded stretch interaction between the leftover dummy atom and the physical atom in the ligand, then you can see that the ensemble of configurations sampled for the mixed topology molecule is going to be different from the ensemble of configuration for the real physical molecule. And as we've shown in this paper in collaboration with Professor David Mobley, if you don't deal with this correctly, there are large errors introduced in the failure results. So therefore, in core hopping FEP, you have to explicitly calculate the finish to break a bound or to form a bound. And this was believed to be extremely difficult because in classical mechanics force field, we usually use harmonic potential to represent bounded stretch interaction. But the harmonic potential approaches infinity when the distance of atoms is infinity, the causing singularity and numerical instability problems in FEP. So to address this difficulty, we have designed this lower functional form called soft bound stretch potential with functional form shown in here. So you, without too much mathematics, you can easily show that when lambda equals one, this potential recovers harmonic potential. And when lambda equals zero, this is zero. And for any value between zero and one, the first and the second derivative of the potential with respect to lambda and R 
are continuous. So we can do AMD simulations using this potential. And in this paper, we prove that by using this functional form, we can rigorously calculate the finish to form or to break a bound, enabling accurate finish calculations for core hopping modifications. So here's one example showing that we can calculate the finish for ring opening closing perturbation. The receptor is EZH2. So the four molecules shown in here are closed analogs of a development candidate in clinical trial. So here, 22 and 27 have a fused ring, 29 and 31 have a single ring. And mutations from 22 to 29 or from 27 to 31 involve the ring opening perturbation. And the calculated binding affinity results agree well with experiment. And one very interesting feature about this SCR is the strong land additivity effect. So I think many speakers talk about land additivity in their presentations. So in particular, in the presence of the five membrane ring in a terminal molecule, opening the ring only modestly increased binding potency by about 0.6 kicker In comparison, in the presence of six membrane ring, opening the fused ring significantly de increased binding potency by about 1.9 kicker And this strong land additivity effect is accurately calculated by core FEP. And we can also evaluate very complex rain structures, like the speaker just mentioned, have a bridged rain. So we can evaluate that accurately. So here's one example. So for base one inhibitors, introducing additional rain to form this very complex bridged rain, the affinity was accurately predicted. We can also evaluate rain size change perturbations. For example, going from a five member rain to six member rain. In, in this case, for E alpha, expanding the rain decreased binding potency significantly, and we get that correct. And moving the caponeo group around the six member rain from here to here, further decreased binding potency experimentally. This is an inactive compound, and all this is accurately predicted by FEP. And we have validated this method on six different targets with many different unique core hopping modifications covering a diverse chemical space. Again, the accuracy is perfect. RMSC is about 0.5 kicker more. So I'm going to show one example where the large scale application of core hopping FEP led to the discovery of a novel chemotype in a very short period of time. In this project, the collaborator became very interested in a development candidate that was recently sent into the clinic. And the, that compound have a sub molar in vitro potency. And all, all of the obvious, like R group modifications, have been covered by existing IP. I think this is very common in, the, in this field. So then we use um, competent tools, enumerated 100 sensing feasible novel cause, and then use FEP, core hopping FEP, to calculate the binding affinity for those 100 molecules. And based on the calculation, six of the molecules were flagged to be synthesized, and then the collaborator managed to synthesize three of the compounds. And here's the results. So it turned out all those three compounds are indeed very potent, and they were not covered by existing IP. And further modification of molecule Z led to the discovery of a development candidate that is currently under consideration. So I have <laughs> note here that using cohopping FEP, the whole process only took three months. By comparison, the brute force chemistry effort will take much, much longer time to achieve the same goal. <coughs> I think this is a very good example demonstrating the impact or the value of accurate finish calculations to speed up drug discovery process. Then I'm going to talk about microcycles. So we know that microcycles occupy a unique region in chemical space, bridging between <coughs> small molecules and biological molecules like peptides, proteins. And in general, they are more difficult to make. However, due to their unique ability 
to balance various properties, including potency, selectivity, membrane permeability, and bioavailability. Microcycles are becoming a very important drug class, particularly for targets that are difficult to drug by small molecule like protein-protein interface I mentioned earlier. So in microcycle drugs recovery, the most important question is, why is there a microcyclization strategy to cyclize the linear molecule into cycle will improve the binding potency? And what is the optimal linker size and the chemical matter for cyclization? And both those two type of perturbations are very difficult for conventional FEP method. So by using the same soft core stretch potential I mentioned earlier, and adjusting the protocol specific for microcycles, we have extended FE plus to support microcycle perturbations. So one example. So here the receptor is MTH1. In this case, cyclizing the linear molecule into microcycle increased the binding potency significantly by about four and five kgap more. And this is accurately calculated by the FEP method. Another two examples. First case, for a pair of base one inhibitors, cyclizing the linear molecule into microcycle increased binding potency by about two kgap more. In the second case, for a pair of CK2 inhibitors, cyclizing the linear molecule into microcycle actually decreased binding potency by about 2.7 kgap more. And both effects were accurately predicted by FEP. And very importantly, in addition to numerical agreement with experiment for the predicted binding finish change, from the simulations, we can also give physical insight as to when and why microcyclization can improve the binding potency. So here's the MTH1 example I mentioned earlier. Here, cyclizing the linear molecule into the cycle increased binding potency by about four kcap more. And we can explain where this four kcap more comes from. So showing here the red and the blue curves are the distribution of this key torsion sampled in solvent and complex. So the upper panel is for the linear molecule, the lower panel is for the microcycle. So by comparing those two plots, you can easily see that the two molecules sample roughly the same conformational space in the complex. However, their distributions in solvent are dramatically different. In particular, while the linear molecule can sample many different conformations in solvent, cyclization limits the amount of conformation space in solvent, reducing the amount of entropy loss experienced upon protein bonding, leading to the improvement in the potency. And we can also evaluate ring size change perturbations like small molecules. Here's one example. So for four check one inhibitors, so with different ring sizes from like four carbon linker to five carbon, carbon linker to six carbon linker, the calculation agree well with experiment. We can also, <coughs> many other examples, I won't talk in detail, and we benchmark this on seven different targets with many different unique perturbations. Again, the RMSC is about one kgap more. And I think yesterday, Katarina from um, Bayer showed one example um, in their results. So they have been using a pre-released version of our method and applied on a few microcycle systems, also obtained very good results and published this result in this paper. Okay, about covalent inhibitors. So covalent inhibitors constitute a significant fraction of approved drugs in the market. And due to their unique ability to achieve very high potency, selectivity, and good pharmacodynamic properties, covalent inhibitors is emerging as a very important drug class for certain disease areas. And the development of covalent ligand FEP was motivated by a research collaboration with Roche. So in this project, the goal is to improve the binding potency of an initial lead compound binding to HCL receptor. So the lead compound have a cyano group that forms a reversible covalent bond with the cysteine residue in the binding pocket. And the task 
is to identify building blocks from a library about 3,000 fragments on this R position with input binding potency compared to the initial need compound. And FEP plus scoring was compared head to head with the three other methods available to the chemists, including the selection based on their experienced medical chemists or from the internal docking or from a docking plus manual inspection by an academic lab with expert knowledge on these systems. And all the four groups are allowed to submit 10 recommendations and five backups before a predetermined deadline. And then the molecules are made and tested after that, so it's truly prospective. It's the thermodynamic cycle of reversible covalent inhibitors showing here. So the first step, it forms a lang covalent complex and then the chemical reaction happens. So if the reaction is reversible, then the binding affinity is determined by the relative energy among those states. So if the equilibrium concentration of the non-covalent complex is much, much lower than the covalent complex, then we can lower the middle state. So then by calculating the energy to mutate from protein ligand one complex into protein ligand two complex, and the energy to, to mutate from ligand one to ligand two insolvent, we can calculate relative binding finish between the two ligands as the formula shown here. So the two lags in the FEP for covalent binding shown here. So in the complex lag, protein ligand one, covalent bonded protein is mutated to protein ligand two and then solvent is similar. So we applied glide docking and MMGBSA identified lanting two molecules for further analysis by FE+. And based on the FE+, calculations, we recommended 10 molecules plus five backups. And then the collaborator made 10 of the compounds selected by FEP, and also 10 compounds from each of the three other methods. Okay, this is important. So here's the results. So eight out of 10 recommendations by FEP indeed bind stronger than the reference. By comparison, all the three other methods available to the chemist, they only identified one potent binder compared to the initial lead compound. And the common compound identified by three methods, compound three, is an obvious potent binder based on the existing experimental SCR. And also, the structures selected by FEP is very diverse. I think this clearly speaks to the power of accurate pr prediction in energy to speed up lead optimization process, particularly to input binding potency. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'm gonna briefly talk about our effort to do charge perturbations. So as mentioned earlier, so sometimes in the discovery project to improve the solubility or to improve the potency or to balance other enemy toxicity problems, the chemists we may consider mutations that change the net charge of the molecule. For example, for a pair of PTB1B ligands, replacing the charged ring by a neutral moiety increased binding potency by about 1.8 kicapmole. So we all know that the periodic boundary condition in MD simulation introduces artifacts in the long range electrostatic interaction calculations. And in, I think back in 2014, many speakers have talked about their method to deal with charge perturbations, including Ben Waru, uh, Gabe Rocklin, and a few other folks. <coughs> so over the past few years, we have been working on systematically approach to address those charge perturbations and develop our unique protocol. So our method is similar to what many people have tried before. So the idea is very simple. So for perturbation between a neutral molecule and a charged molecule. We introduce a very special molecule in the molecule, in the system. So the charge of the special molecule is zero for the neutral ligand state, and the charge for the special molecule is plus or minus one for the charged ligand state. In other words, when mutating a neutral molecule into a charged molecule, 
we simultaneously turn on the interactions between an ion of opposite charge with the environment. In this way, the net charge of the two physical endpoints is zero, and the artifact is largely removed. And in practice, this is achieved by changing a water molecule into a sodium or chloride ion. So the purpose of using water is to avoid this special molecule in the neutral state getting stuck in hydrophobic environments. This is particularly important for membrane-bound proteins because the hydrophobic particles can easily get stuck in lipids. So for the PDB1B example I showed earlier, so we applied four different methods on this system. So the first method is the regular FEP without any special treatment on the electrostatic interaction energy calculations. Second is the charge that uses the PB correction to correct the artifact in the um, long-range electrostatic interaction calculation, similar to what um, Gabe Rocklin and David Mobley introduced in their paper. The third method uses the solvent electrostatic offset potential correction, similar to what Professor Bamaru introduced in his paper. And the last one is the air chemical water approach we called, I just mentioned in the previous slide. And for each method, we tried two sets of experiment. In the set, first set of experiment, we only have counter ion to neutralize receptor. In the second set of experiment, in addition to the counter ion to neutralize receptor, we also put additional salts to mimic the ionic strength of the buffer solution. And the dash black line is the experimental value for this perturbation. So we can see that if you don't have any special treatment because of the artifact in the electrostatic energy calculation, you have lar very large box size dependence. I think which many people have already known this. Not very surprising. And also, the additional salts in buffer solution have a big effect on the calculated band infinity. And this is well captured, studied experimentally. By comparison, using all the other three methods, so the box size dependency problem is largely removed. And also, the results from three methods are within the statistical laws of each other. And the results with the additional source agree well with experiment. Those are the uh, solid line. And then we tested the same protocol on a large data set with more than 10 targets, with more than 30 unique charge perturbations. The summary is shown here. The overall RMSC is about 1.1 kcapomol in comparable to the accuracy for the neutral perturbations. So in summary, so starting from 2015, after we making the R group modification and single atom mutation perturbations accurate and reliable, we have been doing more research to develop global methods to push the boundaries of the finished calculation methods to enable accurate calculations for the following very challenging perturbations, including core hopping modification, microcycle perturbations, covalent bonding, and charge perturbations. And both the retrospective validation and prospective applications of those methods have demonstrated their high level of accuracy and reliability. And then with this, I'd like to acknowledge the very long list of people who have contributed to this work. And thank you all for staying so late to listen to my talk. Thank you. Questions for Lingo? Yeah. So on your um, corn hopping scheme, where you're doing these softened bonded terms, mm -hmm. are you also having to come up with softened angles and softened torsions as well? Or is it just the <coughs> And uh, the, the bonded stretch are most important. The angles and the dihedral angles, uh, softening those potentials also helps, but it's not that critical because you have a fixed boundary. The, the potential won't go to infinity. Christopher? Larger, smaller dipole, would it make a difference whether the water was 
so, yeah, so, so, the, so the problem you just mentioned, pro probably is relevant if you only have one special charged ion. But the trick is here, you have many more ions than just that special molecule. So the overall effect is smeared out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It puzzling people to me as well. I so I imme immediately initially I didn't suspect it will work so, so well, but the results just uh, came out so great. I don't know. I don't have a answer to. But specifically, you had an expo a mechanistic explanation involving these yeah. torsion angles, right? But if you look at those torsion distributions, there's no way that difference in population could explain a four k Kelvin mole difference. So what what are we missing? What's the mechanistic explanation? I mean, so, you see a little bit of shifts around, but maybe it's a factor of four. So I don't know, I don't know why you say this is a little shift, but not a big shift. Comparing the two red curves, not only the number of conformations are different, also the relative population is quite different. So you have to pay a large penalty yeah, to... That, that peak on the right, right? <coughs> the peak on the left in the upper plot, that's not 4K for mole. That's, that's we can quantify that. We can do an experiment to quantify that. You can. You can do very, very long sample and use, for example, the, um, um, the uh, entropy, like, for example, using the, Sher uh, the Sheridan yes. entropy formula, the rigorous calculate the entropy. We can do that. I think the, for this particular case, I'm convinced it's coming from the entropy difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, but but one t a torsion is not all of the entropy. That's just yes. and the, also, the 10 or so degrees of freedom collapsed yeah. onto one degree. And also, you have to remember this here. I'm going to show you, only showing one particular torsion, which is important. And there are so many torsions that contribute to the entropy, right? They add up together. There should be also internal strain on these different molecules. That's reflected in, the, in this population. So, so this internal strain is not just a product of reduced entropy, but as Calvin's contribution to the basement of reorganization. <coughs> Yeah, so here I'm showing the population. So the whatever internal strain energy will be reflected in the, in the final population. So that's not, I think it contributes, but it's already reflected here. Yeah, I, I think trying to do any and understand one degree of freedom is not going to give you any meaningful results. You'd have to look at more. Or you can do the final temperature difference to calculate the free energy as a function of temperature. So you can Right, that'll that give you the entropy, but it won't really explain why the entropy. Yeah. You can depopulate that population by putting a barrier there, right? That's true, yes. And for this particular problem, is this looking at um, the case where it's the protein-protein uh, binding and interference? No, in this case it's not. It's just the same, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can, you can also run the FEP calculation for, the, for this lag and this lag, and then you can, you can, you can like get an idea about the relative finish between those two states. And you can see the difference is really dramatic. It's more than four gigabyte. So basically mean, means the population of this is neglectable. Yeah, so in, in general, I think, uh, yeah, you can, you can do additional step to explore the relative energy between those two states. But in this particular case, we validated <laughs> this is not an important state. Oh, right. yeah. So we have time for one more question because I want to ask a question and I'm the moderator. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm really impressed by your, um, the, the size, the small size of the error for the absolute change in charge. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned a paper by Gabriel Rockland and David yeah. Mobley, and yeah. um, I think what they showed and other people have seen is, is salt bridges tend to be overpredicted. So did you see any systematic, uh, I mean, yeah. the, your results are so good, does that mean we don't need polarizable force fields? So yeah, we, we do, actually we do have evidence um, for perturbations that break the salt bridge. It is actually more difficult and the error bars are larger. But uh, in this case, uh, I think the majority of them are 
a partially zone exposed. Oh, okay. So even if you yeah. have a salt bridge, you have other interactions that compensate that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do believe that polarizability will play some role for the um, some particular chemical groups. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, let's thank Lingle, and then uh, I have a couple of announcements.